Welcome to the digital shift in dialogue, British and German perspectives on openness and the digital transformation research libraries. This is a wonderful joint initiative by RLUK, Research Libraries UK, and VDB, Verein Deutscher Bibliothekarinnen und Bibliothekare, the association of the association, sorry, of German librarians. So welcome also on behalf of VDB. I'm Ewald Brahms from Hildesheim University, and as a VDB board member, I take care of our international relations. So, and I'm very happy that uh, this event is now taking place. It took uh, a lot of organization beforehand. Thanks so much to you, Mel and Ed and Torsten, uh, for doing all the wonderful things you've been doing and making this happen. Um, Thank you also, uh, Constanze and Anke. Constanze is our VDB, VDB president right now, and she'll be joining us later with the talk on, on what's going on with library spaces at Erlangen Nuremberg University. Thank you, Constanze, and thank you, Anke, our new president from Halle University, uh, for supporting us and for giving us all the help we needed to bring this into place. Um, today, we'll focus on library spaces and openness post COVID-19. Um, and you see on the screen um, that there will be another event uh, in a week from today uh, that will focus on openness and library systems. Uh, I'm delighted that we have such a broad audience, so 50 plus right now, uh, about 100 colleagues signed in beforehand, uh, and we have colleagues from the UK and from Germany. Uh, so let me say a few words in German at this point, and that, then I'll get back to English again. Uh, liebe Kolleginnen und Kollegen, uh, es freut mich sehr dass Sie sich heute Vormittag die Zeit nehmen für unsere Veranstaltung, unsere gemeinsame RUK VDB Veranstaltung und damit für den Austausch mit unseren britischen Kolleginnen und Kollegen. Ähm, ich glaube, das bietet einen guten Rahmen für äh, Meinungs-, Ideens-, Ideenaustausch äh, heute, aber auch darüber hinaus. Und einige von Ihnen waren vielleicht schon bei der Auftaktveranstaltung in Bremen dabei und haben so schon erste Eindrücke gewinnen können von unserer gemeinsamen Initiative. Zögern Sie nachher bitte nicht, Fragen zu stellen. Äh, entweder spezifische Fragen direkt nach den Präsentationen oder allgemeinere äh, nach den beiden Präsentationen. Äh, fragen Sie gerne auch auf Deutsch. Thorsten Reimer und ich werden dann äh, versuchen zu übersetzen und äh, Matt wird uns dabei unterstützen. Ich glaube, das bekommen wir alles ganz gut hier. Dear colleagues, Thorsten and I agreed that uh, our introduction should be short. Uh, so I will stop here and Thorsten, please continue. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Thorsten Reimer. I'm head of content and research services at the British Library. And I'm also chair of our UK's Digital Shift Working Group. And so just want to say just very briefly, I don't think we need to say very much about why we've done this work. I think it's will be on everyone's mind that um, while we've had digital and digital transformation in libraries for many years, in fact, decades, we've seen quite a significant, I think, acceleration of that change. And so the UK community, we felt it would be useful to do something to help our members be better prepared for the, for the digital changes and also to realize that it's not just about moving from analog and physical to digital, but it's finding the right balance between different elements of digital and realizing that really it's about bringing digital and physical together. And that's also one of the reasons why spaces uh, and how we can use and navigate them is, is an important part. When we put together the Digital Shift Manifesto, where we outlined some ambitions and also some pieces of work that we wanted to uh, kick off over the next few years, we realized there's a massive piece of work ahead for libraries. And while the UK is lucky to have, I think, a really agile library community, um, 
and really strong thinking on, on digital, it's very clear that we can't do this on our own. So the digital shift, I think, has been international from the start. But I think in some ways that international parts become even more important to us. And I think that's something that I can say for myself, for the British Library, and I think also for our UK, that um, despite Brexit and all the recent political changes, not only do we think we all need to work together, we want to and want to keep working together. So I think today's activity and perhaps some follow-on activities that will come from are really a chance to learn from different international experiences and in a way also certainly from our end, a commitment that we, we still want to be and will be international partners. We very much see ourselves as working in international environment. So that's just maybe as a, as a brief uh, comment. Uh, another one also to say is we thought we'd do a few initial events to see how this goes and see how much interest there is. So I think if, say, after this event or after next week events, you think you would like to see more of this, you have ideas, please do get in touch with any of us. Interesting to see what's useful for all of us as a community. And with that, I'll also um, keep my introduction short and I'll hand over to Matt, who will do a brief uh, housekeeping uh, also partly because he and colleagues at our UK have uh, kindly set this all up and I will then go into our presentation. Thank you, Torsten, and thank you, Evald. Uh, my name is Matt Greenhall and I'm the Deputy Executive Director of Research Libraries UK and we are delighted to be able to host today's meeting in association with VDB. This is a really important collaboration for us and as Torsten said, Despite um, all of the political uh, challenges that we might find ourselves in, um, collaboration and working across borders has never been as important or as valuable as it now is. So we're delighted that you're all with us. A few pieces of housekeeping. Today has been run as a meeting and we've, we're doing that rather than a webinar so people can really interact and have a discussion and ask questions and this can be very interactive. So please do, do keep your mi microphones muted um, throughout until you um, are ready to ask a question and during some of the discussion section of today's session. It would be fantastic to be able to see you all, so please um, do put your camera on if you are happy to do so. It's wonderful to put faces to names and to have some of these conversations face to face. So please, if you are comfortable, do activate uh, your camera. Be aware, though, that we are recording today's session. So this is being recorded. And if you do activate your camera, you will be uh, featured in that recording. And these recordings will be uh, made available on the REUK. Uh, website and also via VDB as well and this is for people who can't be with us today. If you do have any comments or questions throughout today's session please do post them in the chat at the bottom of the screen and these questions can be posted in either English or in German and they will be translated by Evald and uh, Torsten into uh, English uh, during the session so please do put your questions or comments in chat. And if any of you are on Twitter, which I'm sure many of you will be, the hashtag for today's session is hashtag RUKDSF, because this session is part of the Digital Shift Forum that RUK have been delivering since um, October of last year. During the question and answer session, um, after each paper, there'll be an opportunity for you to pose your questions uh, verbally to colleagues, and please do raise your hand um via the raise your hand function and then you'll be able to ask your question to our um, presenters verbally through your microphone the only other final thing i'll mention is that we do have a transcription um, service within zoom today so if you'd like to see subtitles um, and and hear see live transcriptions of our speakers and what they're saying you can do this by selecting the citation option at the bottom of the screen in the zoom tool toolbar and you should then be able to see transcriptions appearing live on screen as they're spoken and that's it from me. It's a real pleasure to see you all. And I'll now hand over to the first speaker, who I know will be familiar to many of you, particularly at the RUK community, and that is Ed Fay, Director of Library Services and University Librarian at the University of Bristol. So over to you, Ed. Good morning. So I hope you can see that. Great, so thank you so much for the invitation. It's great to be with you this morning and to share some of our experience from Bristol. And I'm really looking forward to the dialogue that this event is set up to foster. So uh, very much looking forward to that. 
So just to share a little bit of the context from the UK that we've been working in, as with all of us, we've seen a very disrupted year, but I think we can see some very specific effects within the UK and certainly within our university. So in terms of our incoming students, we have seen a fairly rapid growth in our intake. So for Bristol, this has meant a 12% increase in our student numbers just in this year. And this is a result of the way that exams have been handled within the UK, within our education system. And this has meant a lot of disruption to students, both in the last year, but also likely through this year as well, as they go through the application cycle. Also within the UK, we are seeing a demographic shift in the number of applicants to universities and 21-22 is seeing record numbers of applications. So as well as this disruption, HE is becoming a very competitive environment for access to students. Within the political environment, we are seeing a fairly new and emerging regulatory environment. We have a new office for students and we have a government that is shifting its position in the way that it handles its COVID regulations, which at the moment is pushing responsibilities from central government to institutions to determine their approach. And in the wider context, we have disruption in the way that uh, universities are funded, and this applies both to student funding, but also to research funding, and a, a fairly hostile positioning from government in terms of universities' role in things like free speech, which are very much relevant to the, uh, the theme of openness today. Within Bristol, we are currently undertaking a strategy refresh, both in response to this environment, but also the changes that we're seeing from COVID, that is considering the longer term futures of the institution. And this is also then considering the curriculum framework, which determines the, the aims, the content, design, outcomes, teaching, learning and assessment of our educational offer. So some of our experience through COVID is likely to be familiar to many. We have seen the types of teaching that are delivered face to face under significant pressure, the kinds of teaching that is delivered uh, online then go through a number of iterations and a number of changes. We are looking ahead to the question of the future of large lectures and the effectiveness of online teaching, particularly when it comes to smaller group seminars and face to face. We see, however, a, a strong feeling within our student body of a preference for face to face teaching, but perhaps a misalignment around what face to face teaching actually delivers in terms of contact hours and exposure to both the research and the academics within the institution. But very quickly at Bristol, we moved to halt a number of capital programmes that were due to enhance our large lecture capture facilities. So that has been pulling those plans um, in the short term, and, and I think it's unlikely that we will see those reinstated anytime soon. What we're also seeing is that models of blended learning are already creating demands for new kinds of space. So particularly in the way that our assessment has moved online, but also moved to open book and collaborative types of assessment, and also the need to participate in online synchronous teaching has ironically created a further demand for space. We are also seeing, I would say, probably at the very edges at the moment, uh, experimental work around augmented reality and virtual reality. And I draw a parallel there to work that's going on within our special collections around virtual reading rooms. So really considering the ways that we are delivering into teaching of the institution. It seems as well that there are some, some, both some positives and also some negatives to what we're experiencing. There seems to be benefits to the degree to which education is personalised during this experience. The idea that students can engage in times and places and paces of learning that suits them. And this is very much supported by our investment in digital content. And also the suggestion that for some students, uh, participating in online or blended lectures actually is a more inclusive experience. There are, in theory, some fewer barriers to participation and we're seeing greater engagement from students who have been less engaged in the past. But the countervailing uh, side of that is that issues of digital belonging and community have been far harder. So within our library, we have been providing study skills in virtual forums. So we've been providing virtual retreats and study lounges. And we are increasingly now seeing demands from academics to embed this further into the curriculum and to provide these as toolkits for ways that schools and programs can work with their cohorts. But we have also seen a very strong set of feedback from students that feelings of connectivity suffer in online only environments and feelings of isolation are exacerbated. 
And then considering the disruption that school leavers and new entrants to the university have experienced, we are then considering the, uh, the ways that students are supported in their transition to higher education but particularly the effect that this has on uh, students who may have felt those pressures uh, most extremely. So I think we can all recognise that the pandemic has really heightened social inequalities, uh, made those structural issues within society more visible. And so for us, that really forces us to think about the ways that we are supporting students uh, in transition to university, but also those longer terms of widening participation, given the disruption that school leavers will have uh, for a number of years. The student experience then has been again very disrupted so we have had very stringent travel controls both for international students but also nationally within the UK. We have had very specific controls on what kinds of activities can take place within our campus. But what has become very clear is the degree to which students really rely on access to our university campus. And it's very clear that that access is most important to students who are most disadvantaged. And it has very rapidly shown the myths that exist around the university about the extent to which our students are fluent and confident within digital environments and even have access to very basic facilities such as a laptop and a reliable internet connection. We've also then seen this environment create significant pressures on well-being and mental health and associated increases in the kinds of cases that we are dealing with within the university services, but also the kinds of issues that we encounter just within our library spaces from our colleagues on the ground. And there are some quite stark statistics there from the UK's Office for Students, which suggests the extent and degree of the issues that students have been experiencing through this year. So at Bristol, our intention as we move forward is to take a perspective across what we are starting to term the learning campus. And these are some of the principles uh, that we intend to go about that work on. So this is intended to have a holistic view of the kinds of spaces and kinds of environments that are available to our students and to ensure that that takes a very student centred perspective on the ways that teaching are delivered and the way that learning happens within a blended environment. I suppose there are really three themes to this. The first is around academic achievement and well-being, noting that these are the environments within which a large amount of learning experiences take place, but they are also central to the experience uh, of students and their well-being in those learning experiences. It's also clear that our learning campus is central to developing a sense of community, both for the university, but also within cohorts and specific programmes. And there is also a sense of place that comes from this. And this is uh, true across the life cycle of our student journey. So from recruitment, when someone visits to an open day, right through to the lifelong associations that exist within our alumni community. And we're also very clear that the quality and provision of our learning campus is both aspirational and inspirational, not only for our students, but also for our academics in the ways that they go about their teaching. And so they need to have spaces which are set up, which are digitally enabled to support their work in a blended environment. And we can also see, I think, that we have certain learning in the short term, but we're fairly sure that what we are seeing now in terms of blended learning is likely to continue to change requirements in coming years. So these are the kinds of spaces that we are thinking about at Bristol. So just to show that sort of spectrum of use, there's nothing in here that is particularly surprising, I think, but what we are expecting is that we will see different kinds of evolutions within different kinds of spaces and certainly um, probably asymmetric pressures on different kinds of learning space. And when we consider those couple in the middle around online assessment and online teaching, what we are seeing in the short term is actually our estate is very poorly set up to support those kinds of learning activities and in the pandemic we have had a particular focus on providing quiet study and face-to-face -face teaching while those other areas have really been squeezed due to matters of emergency so for us those is the, the issues of balance those issues of how these spaces evolve continuously and provide a holistic and consistent experience um, is starting to become uh, of strategic importance to us so to talk a little bit then about our new university library project, and it's worth noting that what I will speak about is a series of designs and approaches that have not been revisited since the COVID pandemic. So our new university library project has been running for a number of years. It completed a certain design phase in late 2019 and was then subsequently granted planning permission only in early 2021 during the pandemic. 
So these principles and the intent for the University of Bristol to invest in a library were set long before the pandemic. And our president and vice chancellor, Professor Hugh Brady, has a, a fairly wide reaching statement of ambitions around the reasons for making this investment. And it's interesting when looking at the vision statement that this is both about the student experience, but also has very clear ambitions around the ways that this strengthens our research reputation, the ways that research and education can come together within spaces, the role that the university and the library plays within the wider community. Um, the ways that libraries support belonging, but also support engagement from wider communities and very much looking ahead to the future. So it's very interesting for us to consider the extent to which these principles stand up during uh, the, the COVID experience that we've had. So it seems to us that the design principles that were the basis for the specific approach to the building and to the infrastructure within the building <clears throat> actually remain relatively sound as a result of, of COVID. And actually many of the themes and the priorities that we have seen emerging from our academic community and from our student community are well recognised within these approaches. I think for us the question now is, do the specific designs match the specific academic and student behaviours that we are now anticipating will be coming forward in coming years? So we had already built into the, the, the designs of the building, the fabric of the building principles of well-being. This is uh, about the ways that spaces are configured, the ways that the building is naturally heated and naturally lighted, the variety of spaces, things like the colour palettes and the tone and the routes in uh, and availability of certain facilities within the building. And also key to the design process was inherent flexibility. And this for me is the one that really will now be tested is do we have that absolutely right in the designs such that what we are seeing now that we need to deliver will actually be supported within the building? To what extent will we need to revisit some of those fundamental assumptions? And uh, as I've mentioned already, speaking within the context of our wider capital program, already assumptions that were in place a couple of years ago about the types of teaching spaces for large lectures have already been revisited and, and subject to de-emphasis within the programme. So the question for us now is will the library stand up in that same sort of way? So just to give you a little sense of what the intentions are to take place within the building and at the top here we can see a quote from a Bristol scholar and the Bristol scholars scheme is intended to widen participation within higher education and this is a statement that one of our scholars submitted to the planning process when we were seeking permission from the, the city council to proceed with the build and it's very clear the extent to which that purpose here to support inclusivity to support access to facilities is really really important to the whole community certainly but particularly from an EDI perspective where we cannot assume that students will have certain access to certain facilities. So the building is intended to provide about 2,000 seats, about half a million books and journals within those spaces. It is intended to be an inherently interdisciplinary space that provides collaborative environments. That is both for students to come together, for students to come together with academics and for the university community to come together with the wider city community. In terms of the digital shift, the library is designed with an infrastructure that is part of a, a very smart learning campus. And this means that from the simplest level, it has power and data infrastructure that will support the evolution of things like the Internet for Things. It will support uh, very high levels of technology uh, enabled learning and study. And that infrastructure then should support an evolution of the kinds of applications and the kinds of systems that are built on top of that. What uh, we have inherent within the building, again, is, is, is deep accessibility, both in terms of the physical spaces, but also in terms of the network. So the networks will be intended to be open, not only to the university community, but also more widely. And will also provide real-time availability. So there will be both the ability just to turn up and to walk into spaces, 
also to book spaces, and also to determine in real time the availability of spaces such that you can navigate the campus and navigate your learning experience at a pace that suits you. And this is very much an intent of the university's digital strategy to consider not only our infrastructure, but also the ways that the university is a part of the life of the students. So not necessarily assuming that the ways that we set up our spaces and infrastructure will sort every, uh, suit everybody's modes of study. The emerging issues which are testing some of these designs for us are, are probably twofold at the moment. One is around the extent to which our print circulation will be significantly impacted by the level of digital investment that we have made, particularly around textbooks, but also other kinds of digital content and whether we will see a step change in the extent to which our students rely on print circulation within our, our, our future setup. And also what has become very clear is that we are working in far more integrated and embedded ways across the university services, which has always been an ambition, uh, particularly when we consider the responses that have been needed to support wellbeing through the pandemic. We have worked far more closely in a digital environment with our peer services across the university, which makes us consider then actually what is the extent to which we need to more deeply co-locate services for students within a physical environment as we emerge from the pandemic. In terms of the theme of openness, it's also crucial that our library project supports the ways that we engage with the community around us. And what we have here is a quote from a writer in residence who spent time in our theatre collection, which will be part of our Centre for Cultural Collections. And this was a result of a programme that works closely with schools within certain parts of the city. So this writer is of uh, black heritage. She comes from a school within a ward of Bristol that uh, is indicative of multiple deprivations. And it's really stark for me, the expression here that really challenges some of the assumptions we have about the perceptions of universities, the perceptions to the degrees to which we are open and available for people to use us. And, um, you know, just, just the, the kind of, uh, belief that you are welcome and you are allowed into our spaces is not always prevalent and so we need to consider how are we fostering this. So within the designs the ground floor of the building is intended to be completely open for public access and this will provide free unfettered access to our creative labs and our digital technology within that to our exhibition spaces and events program. It will provide a cafe and also a changing places facility, which is an accessible facility that supports people who are not able to use uh, normal disabled toilets. So people who suffer from uh, particular disabilities. And our intent in doing this is both to open access to our facilities and to open access to our collections and to support the kinds of engagement that can take place with our collections, but also very much to direct this towards the educational, creative and social outcomes for the communities around us. And so what is absolutely central to this is not only the facilities, not only the ways that we are working, but the relationships that we are able to build. And so as part of designing these spaces, we have very specific plans for audience development to develop this openness to new, to new communities, which, meant, which means that we have worked with local community organizations. We have worked with young Bristolians. We have considered the age ranges of 15 to 25. So both how we partner with schools, but also how we work with people who may never have a route to higher education as their destination in mind when they engage with the university. So how are we supporting skills development, career development? How are we supporting creative production and in-school learning, uh, as well as considering widening participation and routes to university? We have considered working with uh, targeted adult group visitors, so adults who are suffering from social isolation, wellbeing partnerships with social health care, as well as independent adult visitors and how the new library can become a cultural destination within the city. And then also working with industry partners around the city. So how do we work with the cultural and creative industries to produce really innovative digital programming again to reach new audiences? And this idea of openness then extends into the realm around the building itself. So these are statements from our public realm and public art vision, because a key part of this development will be not only the building of a new space, but also considering the public realm and the interface with the city uh, in, in the immediate region. So this is considered issues of design and heritage, so how the building fits into the existing infrastructure around it and the design has taken a lot of account of the conservation areas, the references that exist between local buildings and local landmarks, 
but also uh, importantly issues of the extent to which this is a green space, a sustainable space, the extent to which it supports cycling, the traffic flows in and around the building, pedestrianisation, the extent to which humans are centred within that environment and put first in terms of priorities for movement through the space. And our public art programme then will both create exhibitions within the building, also exhibitions in the public realm outside the building, but also then considering partnerships with other cultural organisations and how this as a cultural destination fits within the wider cultural programming of the city, recognising for us that art can be a prism through which debates are focused. So considering how are our collections interpreted within the public realm as ways of staging that openness and engaging through into the spaces and also more widely within the city. So finally, for me, just in terms of our priorities and immediate next steps, in terms of student experience, there's a lot of emphasis within the university about the ways that students navigate their environments. So within the digital environment, the ways that students are able to seek information, to find the support that is available and relevant to them, and also the number of systems and platforms that they are asked to learn and then engage with in a blended learning environment. Community and belonging and well-being, again, is a systematic program across our programs, across our central services and across uh, the ways that we are working in partnership with different services to ensure that what we're doing is student centred and that a blended world is really rebalancing those issues of cohort identity and community, both within our programs, but also within our wider university. In terms of our learning campus, we are seeking to further conversations about future blended learning models, but also seek to understand through very ethnographic approaches the kind of student behaviours that are manifesting within our environments to ensure that our programmes for development are really responsive to really understood needs, uh, but recognising that this will continue to evolve over a period of time. In the immediate term, we are addressing spaces for online assessment and online synchronous teaching as a matter of urgency. And for the library, that means that we are removing uh, print collections uh, from a number of basements and other spaces around the campus as a matter of urgency. That work is actually going on at the moment. And then as we move forward into this blended world, what's absolutely crucial for us is that we take the physical and digital together, see these as hybrid blended environments and put the human at the centre of all of these design process, uh, processes um, so that we ensure that these environments are really responsive not only to uh, the needs of the university but also to the needs of the people within our university community and so that was uh, what I was going to say thank you well thank you very much Ed um, that was very impressive uh, you uh, mentioned a lot of issues that are also important to for us with regard to our library buildings and without uh, and with regard to uh, making changes with regard to our COVID-19 experiences. Um, are there any questions directly to Ed at this point? No questions so far. No problem. No problem. He's still here. We're still in our session. So you can also ask questions later. Um, well, um, our next speaker is Constanze Zollner. She is the Director of Library Services and University Librarian at Friedrich Alexander Universität Erlangen Nürnberg. Um, FAU. FAU is a large university in Bavaria, and Constanze will give you further details on uh, FAU in a few moments. Um, the university is situated in Erlangen and Nuremberg, and the city of Erlangen is known, among other things, for the former headquarters of Siemens. Many of you might know Siemens for its products and services in building technologies, drive technologies, energy, uh, healthcare, etc. Um, so that's a big company, uh, and uh, they have their headquarters uh, in the so called Himbeer Palast, Raspberry Palace. And I'm curious to learn. Uh, why they named that building uh, a Himbeer Palast. Um, well, that leads me directly to Constance's presentation. Um, she will talk about lib 
about the library building process for the humanities and social sciences as at FAU, uh, a center for the humanities at the Raspberry Palace. Constanze. Thank you very much, Eva. <laughs> I hope you see my presentation. So good morning, everyone. First of all, let me thank you all for coming here today. I'm really happy that FDB and Research Libraries UK are co-hosting this online event. I would also like to thank Ewald Brahms and Thorsten Reimer who initiated and organized this joint series of events. Thank you very much. I think a digital shift is certainly the appropriate keyword for dialogue on digital transformation, openness, and the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic. Let me introduce myself. As Ebert already has said, I'm Constanze Sörner. I'm Director of Library Services at FAU. And I'd like to talk to you today about the library space for humanities and social science at our university. FAU intends to concentrate large parts of its faculty of humanities, social sciences, and theology at the Erlangen site in the center of the city of Erlangen. This opportunity, opportunity arose when the Siemens company announced that it would move from the center to the Siemens campus in the south of the city. However, uh, our university's ambitious plans are not limited to Erlangen. The Nuremberg part of the faculty, primarily the educational sciences, is also getting a new building. Oops. First of all, I would like to give you an idea of the initial situation at FAU. FAU is in some ways a special and unique institution because it is a comprehensive university incorporating a faculty of medicine and a faculty of engineering. Maybe we are not so uh, unique, but I learned that Bristol has also a faculty of engineering, what is very interesting for me. Traditionally, our faculty of humanities was the largest faculty in the university. But in recent years, it has been outpaced by our faculty of engineering. FAU also has a high number of foreign students compared to other German universities, about 14%. Most foreign students are enrolled in the Faculty of Engineering and the Faculty of Natural Sciences. The great importance of our Faculty of Engineering in particular can be seen in the faculty's third-part funding strength. 37% of all third-part funding at FAU is acquired by only one faculty. FAU also thanks its first place ranking in the Reuters Innovation Ranking, its Faculty of Engineering. The MP3 standard was developed here in cooperation with Fraunhofer Institute for Integrated Circuits. Therefore, it is not surprising, I think, that our president also holds a chair at the Faculty of Engineering. So it often feels to me more like I'm working at a technical university, even though FAU isn't one. I think knowing this background is important to understand the significance of the transformations at the Faculty of Humanities. The libraries at the Faculty of Humanities in Erlangen are largely in a state of constructions of the 1950s and 1960s, although renovations have been carried out regularly. Organizationally, one has to deal with a large number of departmental libraries, very small departmental libraries. In addition to their fragmentation, the humanities libraries also suffer from a lack of space. This is Institute für Hochschulentwicklung identified a lack of space of over 4,000 square meters. The library situation therefore was rated poorly, as you can see, by students in rankings. In 2007, for example, for FAU was in the bottom group in the majority of categories in the ranking of the Zentrum für Hochschulentwicklung on libraries for the humanities. This also put it in last place compared to other universities in Bavaria, which is very sad. For this reason, the de departmental libraries have been planned to be brought together for quite some time. 
The final push was given by the purchase of the so-called Himbeerpalast in Erlangen in 2018. By the way, the name is derived from the pink color of the building. Rapsberry Palace is building, is pink. On one year before, the Council of Ministers had decided that the educational sciences should remain in Nuremberg. This was contrary to what the faculty intended. In the course of the developments, the education division in Nuremberg will now also receive a new building. This will be located in the north of Nuremberg, much closer to Erlangen than the current building from 1967. The COVID-19 pandemic has once again brought to light the disadvantages of our old fashioned system in the humanities. At a time when researchers, students and faculty are no longer on campus, the need for electronic media and document delivery services increases, of course. Connecting many small libraries to central pickup locations or a delivery service is costly. The effort increased the defect that some are purely reference libraries. Thus, the print collections in small libraries were often not as accessible when the large locations already were open again. Students and scholars of the humanities, I would say, were clearly disadvantaged. To significantly improve this situation, there will be two large library locations in future, one in Erlangen, one in Nuremberg, due to the two sides of FA. The faculty has also decided to assign most of the dedicated learning areas to the library. This will create really large areas that can be used in a variety of ways to offer differentiated space. I will get back also to tailor training courses for the humanities a little bit later. Let's get back to the building. I already mentioned that the purchase of the Himbeer Palace by the Free State of Bavaria has set the process of structural development, development in motion. The Himbeer Palace is a very large administrative building from the 1950s that's not suitable for library operations from the outset. Therefore, the library is to be built in the northern courtyard. The historic building is a listed building. So the requirements for the architectural design are very, very high. For example, the Monument Protection Authorities have already indicated that building upwards, it means higher than the lowest part of the building, is viewed very critically. The Himbeer Palace now has 46,000 square meters of floor space. The library area so will partly be added in the courtyard. Partly the library could overlap with the existing building. That depends on the planning design. An EU-wide architectural competition has just started in which a total of 20 firms are participating. The COVID-19 pandemic leads us to some opportunities and risks that may influence the construction process of the libraries. The most important aspect is probably the public budget situation. Here we are in a fortunate position that the building in Erlangen has already been bought. So there is no turning back. The faculty's current buildings, both in Erlangen and Nuremberg, are also partly outdated. But our influential, more influential faculties of engineering and natural science will also need to refurbish their building stock. So it is not surprising that the Free State and the Chancellor have envisaged a gradual realization of the Himbeer Palace project. In this case, it cannot be ruled out that the library will only be built into the courtyard at a later date. The faculty, of course, is fighting tooth and nail separate accommodation for offices and library. However, the space in the historic building is not suitable for housing printed books. So there is at least no danger from the view of the library that the existence of micro libraries will be perpetuated in the Himbeer Palast. Let's look at the planned equipment of the library. The keyword digital shift is of course appropriate here. After decades of fragmentation, the departments would like to have consolidated but still very large print collections in the new library. 
this is a long way to go still. The COVID-19 pandemic has not changed this. Various solutions have been worked out for this. A certain proportion of the books will be housed in compact shelves accessible in the open stacks area. Printed periodicals will not be placed in the library. They will be housed in an external stacks and they will only be delivered electronically. One focus of the space allocation plan lies on the study rooms of which there will be a very large number. They are to support group work and hybrid learning and studying. Other special features to be offered could be maybe retractable monitors, monitors to provide space for large format media or maybe a book machine for printing out ebooks. For the needs of the digital working humanities, so called multimedia labs will be set up. We have deliberately not called them maker spaces because otherwise there could be a risk of confusion with a fab lab run by our faculty of engineering. In these rooms, learning and research in the humanities is to be supported by appropriate technology. This could be, for example, my digital cameras, a UV lamp for fluorescence analysis, VR glasses, or a 3D scanner, or so on. Let us direct our attention to the planned new building in Nuremberg. The library, with an area of, two, of 1,000, 1,557 square meter, is to be located in a new large humanities center. It's also possible that the center will cost, consist of two buildings located in close proximity to each other. The planning and construction process is of special interest here, I would say. An external technical planner has completely taken over the requirements and organizational planning. From the technical planner's point of view, the university library forms only one of eight user groups, in addition to other groups such as the department, the student services, or administrative units. The building is to be constructed on a one-to-one -one basis by a real estate developer in accordance with the specifications drawn up by the technical planner. In this case, too, there are some opportunities and risks as is the case with extensive construction projects. Historic preservation does not play a role at this time. Uh, the building will be completely new. The concrete space requirements have also already been recognized by our Ministry of Science. The special challenge now lies in the construction, construction process. The new building is to be constructed for the university and initially, initially leased for 20 years with subsequent purchase option. As a building to be built to order, all specifications must be laid down in advance, down to the smallest detail, and changes are no longer possible at a later date. Several times our planning group wondered whether we hadn't forgotten things that are self-evident to us but not to outsiders, think of lighting in the workspace, for example. Finally, I would like to discuss which services are offered to the humanities in the new buildings. These are innovations and experiences developed by our library for the last few years. They do not necessarily have to do with the COVID-19 pandemic, but very much with the digital shift that is, that is currently taking place in libraries. With these offers, we are trying to anticipate the new building situation somewhat. The most important here is certainly the Digital Humanities Lab, which was created in cooperation with our EZ Digital, uh, the Interdisciplinary Center for Digital Humanities and Social Sciences, and the Faculty of Humanities. The Digital Humanities Lab is a space and networking, networking offer for now in our main library. Topics of last workshops were, for example, introduction to XML and TEI and sharing and reusing images with IIIF. User engagement is also a topic that has already been on our minds in the run of the building projects. For example, a series of workshops was held with students as part of the nationwide 
learning 4.0 competition from Dini. Your students developed various concepts for digital teaching and, le te and learning methods of the future. The most important thing we learned once again in this competition was certainly that the library space is central for the students. The library as a place, not only as a place, and as a learning community is a starting point for many other activities. According to our students, it not only provides the space, but should also take care that learning can take place at a so as a social event. The digital learning space was not seen by the students as something separate but as a way into the physical learning space. The students proposed to develop a mobile app that would help people find learning partners to meet with in the library. They called this app BitBuddies. For this concept, the students also received third prize in the nationwide con competition. I think this approach will also help us after the pandemic to understand learning in the library as a social event. Perhaps the focus has shifted. It is no longer just about making the ebooks more visible in the physical spaces, for instance. Rather, the app or the mobile phone is the starting point for finding the way into the physical library. I would say our students figured it out already before the pandemic. Online first means also our rooms which are discovered with a virtual visit before you go there and check in. With that, I would like to conclude and look forward for the discussion. Thank you very much. Thank you, Constanze. Um, thank you also for let us look behind the scenes and uh, give us uh, some, some insight into the planning process and um, the um, yeah the opportunities and risks that are involved when you have faculty uh, trying to plan things, etc. Uh, several things sounded very familiar. Uh, so thanks again both to you, Constanze, and to Ed. Apologies for not looking at the chat before. Um, I noticed after Ed's presentation that there were a number of questions uh, with regard to, to Ed's uh, uh, to, 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 to the planning and in Bristol. Uh, so my suggestion is that we take those questions first and uh, try to, to, to find answers to the questions. And Torsten, I need your help here. Um, sure. I know that Annette uh, put a question. I'm scrolling. Can, yeah, yeah, please. I can maybe sort of pick them up from the top, yes. having them here. Thank you. So the, uh, the, the first question that I see in the chat uh, is from uh, Giorgio. And the question was, um, how does the city's authority collaborate with the decision taken by the university? So that, as a reminder, that was a question uh, for Ed. Sure, yes. So uh, the, the project has been very considered about the way that it engages with local communities. And that means residents in the immediate vicinity and there are a number of schools and residents associations as well as partners across the city so that consultation has been built into the design process so that not only has that looked at opportunities for future collaboration but also concerns which uh, you always get in in the uk and, and i'm sure <laughs> in germany and around the world when there is development plans and so there have been some contentious issues to work through in that consultation and then it's on that basis that the proposals are put forward to to the city council to the city authority so uh, these are public uh, events a matter of public records you can look for yourselves that it uh, was a matter of some debate it was not unanimous that the library was a good thing 
there were objections from the perspective of design and heritage and the size of the building, particularly in its fit into the, the, the local context. But the planning authority considered that the public benefit outweighed those concerns. And that is in legislation in the UK, it, it's called the, uh, the weighing balance, when there is considered to be a harm versus a benefit. So the public benefits, particularly the openness of the building, the availability to local communities, partnerships with local schools, creating a new cultural destination were considered to be public benefits that outweighed any concerns about the designs of the building itself. So that's how that came together. But that, that partnership working will very much be an ethos for how we work with those communities around us to really understand both the positive opportunities, but also the concerns so that we can work very positively with those around us. Thank you, Ed. Uh, Maybe I'll ask you a quick follow-up using the, the chair's position uh, for something that popped into my mind. And to maybe set, briefly set this in context, the British Library is open everyone across the world. We don't charge anyone. Anyone can use our service. But we um, run research on people who don't come uh, because we are seen as an elite institution that isn't for so members of the general public very much on my mind is how does one reach out to communities that currently don't consider themselves to be an audience and as you're saying you're opening up this whole floor to the public i think and if you could uh, maybe say a little bit about how far have you reached out to sort of, uh, say local community if, if you have how Sure, that, that, I, I lost you a little bit there, Torsten, but I think you were asking how we engage with communities who are perhaps not already engaged. And yes, yes okay, great. So we are very mindful, I think, that this is not a case of, of building something shiny at the top of the hill that we will just expect will be transformational for people that, that don't even inhabit that part of the city or consider themselves to have a relationship with the university. So very much in the design process, this has been about reaching out to local communities. This has been in parallel with other developments within the city. So it's linked to the university's agenda about the provision of accommodation within the city and the development of a new enterprise campus on a brownfield site within the center of the city. So the university's intent is to shift towards engagement with communities that would not normally be uh, part of our discussions or part of our narrative. So this is building on areas where there are already partnerships with certain local schools. So the Bristol Scholars that I mentioned, there are a number of other initiatives that engage directly with local schools. So this means with heads of schools, with the education boards within the city council, and there are other very formal structures within the city that facilitate that kind of collaboration. But we've also sought very much to work with community organizations within certain parts of the city. So when we say we've worked with young Bristolians, we've worked with a number of arts organizations that provide services and supports within different parts of the city. We've considered not only how these facilities support their activities, but also how what we do around skills and around open content and digitization can be made available to them for forms of reuse that support Support activities that are going on already. We also have the concept of a micro campus developing within the city where the university will seek to externalize what it does into local communities. So this is most apparent around the development of our enterprise campus but will also lead us to consider how we work with local public libraries, other accommodation developments within different parts of the city so that this openness and availability to what the university does will be co-located within those communities. And that will be ways of breaking down uh, barriers to participation, but also perception, so that this is very much seen to deliver into communities and have value and relevance, but it's co-developed with those communities. It's not just assuming that people will understand what we do or just be grateful that suddenly it is here, actually understanding how to develop, how to develop those spaces and then those services with those communities is, is the central ethos. Um, as we move towards the new library, this takes the form of a number of pilots, which are very small scale. So these are ambitions at the moment. In 
practical terms, we are working on very short term fixed pieces of work to explore these models so that we really understand how to develop that in partnership. Great, thank you, Ed. I'm, I'm going to switch my camera off for the moment because I seem to have some network issues, so I'm hoping that takes care of the audio issue. Okay. Um, perhaps yeah. I can uh, read the, the next question. Um, perhaps we can combine two questions. The one is, uh, where are the removed physical collections going to, Ed? Uh, that's the one question. And the other one, um, which goes in a little different direction, uh, a question by Annette. Um, uh, uh, referring to, to uh, spaces um, and uh, she's asking um, uh, how spaces are, uh, have changed with, with regard to office spaces for staff, etc. Uh, thinking of co-working spaces um, and things like that. Uh, so, uh, the one is, uh, uh, let me put it this way, where are the collections going? Uh, the second is, where's the staff going? Uh, would they keep their, uh, their, their offices or will they do uh, desk sharing, etc.? cetera? Of course, I, I'll try to answer those quite quickly <laughs> because this touches on a theme that Constanza and I exchanged in advance about the ways of working that are necessary to respond to this environment. So I'll, I'll try and take you maybe in that direction and, and, and see Constanza's views on this as well. So our collections are going to our research reserve is the simple answer. So we have an off-campus, off-site research reserve. And uh, I can actually see our head of collections management is, is here today smiling uh, because it's of course not as easy as that, but uh, we do already have a facility that, uh, that, that has capacity. In terms of our spaces, so the university will have a blended working approach that will consider the extent to which we are on campus and off campus. We are working in a lot of detail with our teams about what it takes to deliver our services in this new environment. And I think for us, that is considering not only how are we present within our spaces, but particularly that theme I mentioned earlier about partnership working. So actually, how is what we do visible and accessible to students and to academics in, in harmony or in unison with the other reasons why they may be on campus and the other types of services and support that they are trying to access? So for us, it is considering both the individual in terms of preference, the team in terms of what we deliver, but also really crucially the partnership that we need across the university to make that right for students and for academics. And, and, and I don't know whether Constanza, if that's a, a theme that uh, is maybe something you're considering as part of your new initiatives as well. Yes, I would like to give an example uh, what means uh, our personnel, where will they go or where will they be? Um, I think it's noticeable how difficult it is to imagine new, pl new platforms. I think of learning platforms, new room, new working platform. And um, you often cannot imagine how to work in a new environment. Uh, yesterday we had a, a workshop on the folio platform. This is not about rooms. <laughs> But uh, I noticed uh, how, uh, yeah, yes, how difficult this is for many of us when you have worked together in a traditional library system to leave this system. For instance, the acquisition client from CSIS Sunrise, maybe you know this library system, uh, is uh, developed in Erlangen too. And my first concern when I came to Erlangen was that everyone works with a platform we developed in Erlangen. But it was so difficult to leave this situation for, this, for the colleagues that uh, themselves developed a platform. And I think helpful is uh, to take the user perspective. With Folio, it's difficult. Um, Folio is for librarians uh, and you don't know what is the user perspective. Uh, user perspective uh, taken to the rooms is what can we make free for more initiatives uh, or good ideas we have developed with our users. 
I'm still waiting for coming back, my colleagues. I do not hope they do leave us. <laughs> um, uh, but I think it could be helpful to take the user's perspective as we did with the students. You cannot go to the people. Maybe Annette is already uh, in a status that she says, uh, it would be fine for me a co-working space. This is not a situation at Erlangen in Nuremberg. And how, how could have our uh, staff personnel uh, an idea how to work on a new platform, what means the rooms in our libraries? That is difficult, I would say. Perhaps I can add that um, yesterday, actually, we had a discussion. Um, well, the, the, the heads of, of, of library, uh, computer center, major departments with our chancellor, uh, we discussed about uh, the, the effects and, and experiences of this pandemic with regard to working together, uh, office spaces, etc. And uh, what became obvious was that on the one hand, we all want flexibility. We want to keep our flexibility, uh, but at the same time, uh, there's a need for presence. And in, in my case, that means um, although I could do many things at home from my home office, I, I make sure to be here in the library and to be visible and uh, to uh, to talk to people, uh, also to our new president in person. And uh, our chancellor made clear that he expects uh, many of us to return on campus, including also academia. That might not be that easy to do because uh, a number of lecturers, uh, professors are working uh, from Berlin or Munich or perhaps even Nuremberg. Uh, that, that's, that's where what their home base is. So they are working from home doing their lectures and it, uh, we have seen that works, works out all right. I mean, we, we have overcame so many technical problems. But then um, how, how, or what, how should University of Hildesheim 2025 look like? How many students uh, do we want to invite to us? Do we want to have on campus? And also with regard to, um, to the ministries we get funded by and financed by, uh, they are looking at quantities they are not, rather than qualities. So if our student numbers drop significantly, uh, we will run the risk of losing a lot of money. So that implies uh, it's, it's a lot about services and it's a lot about also library services and a lot about library services in present, in the library, on campus. And perhaps the digital transformation also made clear that there is a big need for library space. Uh, last week, uh, students told me, when will you offer more student spaces and more library space? Uh, we, we need you, we need the stacks, we want to go through the stacks. Um, th that's true. Uh, we will open more space, um, but we are also thinking, and, and some of my colleagues are joining us here, wonderful, we are also thinking of, of, of the quality of our services and, and how can we provide better quality um, in 2021 and, and the following years. So, Actually, it links um, quite nicely. Sorry to jump in there into one of yeah, the the sure. the questions from our chat, uh, which I also want to pick up. That was originally one for Ed because because it came up during your talk, but I think it applies really to both, um, and to the the theme that Eva just mentioned. So the, the question is from Patricia, and she asked, um, "A move away from large scale lec lectures in person is likely to change the flow of students around the campus." Does that mean fewer visits uh, for libraries between lectures? So I think a question for both of you really, um, 
which is stronger focus on online. Do you think that will change the student flows? Will it be to smaller number of students? Or how do you approach the forecasting of how many desk spaces you will actually need? Ed, do you want to start or? Please. Oh, please, would you like to, please? please. <laughs> yes, we have much less uh, places for students in the library, of course, uh, because of COVID-19 and uh, it is a controlled uh, check-in. You have to check uh, in online from home and not always you will find a place at the time you need one. I don't know if this is already a new quality. <laughs> um, I think we will need more places and I hope we will have uh, about thousand new places and a new library in some years in Erlangen. Uh, the more the, the university is hybrid or digital, the more you need a place where you can live this social event, uh, studying, learning, be a student and so on. And uh, the library is, simply the heart of the campus, I would say. Yeah, uh, <clears throat> absolutely. That, that resonates a lot, I think, with our experience and, and our expectation. And both to that point and to yours, we're considering the, the size and shape of the university, but also why would students come to campus? What would they be there to do? And so I think we will see a shift my sense is that we are only seeing the beginning of that we are not yet quite clear what blended learning models will mean in terms of formal education delivery and that balance to social experience and there will be a really interesting tension i think between where academics see that evolution and want to take their practice and then the expectation of students of the value of an educational experience. We're seeing some indications that those don't necessarily align around the idea of the value of a lecture and the value of participating with academics and researchers in learning experience. And so for us, the only response to that could possibly be to look at that spectrum of spaces and those different kinds of use and how those are best supported. So in the COVID year, we have seen a lot of pressure for students moving between face-to-face -to, -face to online. And where are they going to do that? In a very practical sense, you've got 10 minutes from uh, a face-to-face -face seminar to go to an online synchronous lecture. How, how does that happen? We've also seen additional pressure from the types of assessment that we've seen. So we don't have traditional examples. We have a lot of online assessments that are open book. You have longer to complete them and more shift towards coursework where you have to work collaboratively and more alongside your peers. So at the moment, what we're seeing is an increased demand on our physical spaces and a narrative and assumption that within our planning, if it's not formal teaching that formally delivered and timetables, it becomes study space for this, study space for online synchronous, study space for collaborative working, study space for assessment. And so at the moment, we are seeing quite an undifferentiated specification of those requirements, but certainly a lot of pressure and expectation from students that we will have the right environments that respond to that diversity of needs. And then absolutely for us, it's about the social, about the community, about the ways that the campus is inhabited. And that applies for us then in terms of the services we deliver, but also for academics. What is an active, thriving community in a blended world is a theme that's very much emerging for us. Thank you. That was very interesting. And sorry for being the, the voice from the off. I think my network connection is still not good enough for having the camera on. Um, I had one question that links more strongly into the digital part, and this is, is a question for me. The Internet of Things has been mentioned and uh, sort of looking at smart buildings. Um, has there been any discussion on um, aspects around privacy and security? I'm, I'm asking this in particular because I think as libraries, we we are or want to be trusted 
uh, which from my end me sort of and letting people control their own information and how it's used really high. On the other hand, there's a lot in building design that can be done with uh, clever use of user data and sensors and so on. Are you both already at the stages where this has come up and has been discussed, or is this sort of too early a question to ask? For Alan and I can say we are not on this stage yet. Uh, we hope to have uh, rooms that are of high quality, uh, but about the Internet of Things, uh, we didn't think yet. Uh, we still struggle with the mass of books, <laughs> uh, with the mass of students, um, and Internet of Things was not a wish from anyone still. But it's interesting for me to hear what Ed is planning uh, in Bristol. Yeah, so for us, the, these are fairly current debates, although I do feel that the library has a role to bring some attention and to focus to this as our digital strategy evolves as a university. So at Bristol, there's a lot of investment in our network infrastructure that is then fed through into new building projects, but is also retrofitting across different areas of our campus. The idea is that this is very much driven by identity and role within the university so that you have layers of access and this applies then both to our civic engagement and what we can make open through to cyber security issues around our research and, and sensitive research data so being very explicit about that absolutely then issues of privacy come into this so what data is exchanged in this environment and we can see this in the library world then about our shift towards digital content and the kinds of user data that is now either explicitly given to publishers or is leaking onto platforms just through the way that behaviors are monitored within an online world so we are very astute to that and our university digital strategy has an explicit theme within it that will then flow through not only into network architectures, but also procurement, which is very deliberate about the kinds of data that are exchanged and then contracts, and also the kinds of services that we would expect to build. And this is very much done then in partnership with students um, as these systems are procured in a blended world and a blended environment. The other aspect for us then touches on these issues of digital belonging and digital community, where we're very, interested in how you support students to understand the building of a digital persona and a digital identity and this is directly supported then from our study skills team and this is both how you participate on in, in, in an online lecture through to these broader societal issues of how you engage as a digital citizen and how you consider issues of privacy and ethics in the way that you go about your digital activities so it, it's fairly current for us um, in the ways that we're going about quite specific areas of work uh, as well as these longer term design issues about infrastructure. Uh, but I, I don't think we know all of the answers to that. It's very much uh, evolving. And, and that ethical position, I think, has to be continuously looked at and continuously iterated in partnership with the people who are affected, which is our students and our academics, and of course, all of us in, in our work environments. Great, thank you. That was really interesting. I think we have one more question in the in the chat that maybe has been partly answered. That was a question for Ed, but I'm giving it uh, a different spin and adding a sort of question onto it for Constance. So Ed, the, the question for you was in particular, I think, how you sort of decided um, with what communities um, uh, you, you needed to engage. And I'd like to add another element uh, to it, which is from consensus talk, we obviously learned about that strong focus on engineering, but also the question about the arts and humanities and their needs. Um, have you found that there's notably different needs in terms of space design and, and user requirements coming from the engineering faculty as opposed to the arts and humanities? Or is it really that the overall sort of space needs are similar, but they maybe have a different emphasis on Yes, we both need roughly the same, but more of this or slightly less of that. So this is really about, I think, the question for both of you, what communities to engage with and how to translate their needs into, into space and service design. So please add once again. <laughs> uh, 
Uh, sure, ha ha happy to take that one uh, initially. So I've, I've spoken a little bit about our relationships with the city, and I think that that will continue to evolve. And, and probably what we've seen in the pandemic is far closer working relationships with things like local health services and a far deeper uh, kind of simpatico, if you like, between the ways that the city operates and the university operates, which is hopefully a positive platform for furthering those relationships. In terms of the disciplinary differences within the university, so in, in one respect, the vision for the new library is that it is inherently interdisciplinary. So it is, as, as Constanza said, the heart of the campus that is very explicit in our thinking. And this was expressed both in the planning application, but also in the wider programs of campus development that the library sits at the heart. And one of the great things about a library is that you can walk through and see someone uh, reading, you know, a dozen items from your research reserve and someone else using a high performance computer to carry out simulations and, you know, equations that are far beyond my understanding. And, and that is inherent in the design that some of this is interdisciplinary. We do then recognize that the kinds of services and infrastructures that support variety within the disciplines does diverge. And for us, some of this is what happens in the library, some of it is beyond the library. So uh, our arts faculty, our Dean of Arts is, has been very clear in COVID as research facilities have restarted that the library is the lab of the arts. Uh, and this is both an access to our research reserve, but also in terms of our, our digital ambitions and digital futures and the way that we support those, those, uh, those research methods and, and, and educational delivery. So there are very specific requirements there. And you can draw parallels then to where, for example, our engineering faculty is seeing particular pressure around the kinds of labs and workshops that are available to students to respond to those growing uh, areas of student numbers, but also the kinds of interdisciplinary collaborations around some of our program developments that is seeking to bring both a social science perspective, but also a STEM perspective together in how the university delivers education and research that solve global challenges. Um, so, uh, you know, the UN SDGs and things like this are very current in how some of that thinking is coming in an interdisciplinary way. So for me, again, it's about that spectrum and understanding that relative set of pressures. So some of our very short term work is actually clearing legacy print journals from the basement of our engineering faculty library to enable them to create a new workshop and digital collaborative space for students that will be then delivered in partnership with the library, which will be on the floor above. So that's an example where we see different forms of partnerships and different forms of requirements coming together in a holistic way, but always from a student perspective but that will continue to emerge. Yes, a question of what communities to engage, to be engaged. Uh, for us, it was, of course, an opportunity when this uh, um, uh, uh, learning for dot zero competition took part. And we took this opportunity and made an invitation to students of the Faculty of Humanities uh, and so we were very happy with uh, what we learned from this project, Jack. Uh, with the researchers, we have a common library commission for, for the humanities faculty. Only this faculty has its own library commission because it was necessary. And with this committee, we meet every half year. Uh, these are the two communities uh, with whom we are engaged. Are there any different needs from the engineering faculty? Uh, uh, what um, means uh, the rooms in the library? There was initiative from the Fab Lab. I already mentioned the Fab Lab from uh, uh, engineering faculty and Fab Lab wanted to settle over to the library. But the library of the uh, engineering faculty is also from the 70s and it's much too small. So it was a very nice idea. But uh, to taking the Fab Lab from more than 100 square meters also into this little small library uh, was simply not possible. Uh, and also this building is not uh, suitable to uh, to have more rooms for the library. So, um, yes, I'm sad, it's sad, but FabLab stayed as it was. 
but we just renovated uh, the uh, faculty library from the engineering uh, science and they wanted to have learning compartments <laughs> and a ventilation. And so they get it, uh, a ventilation and learning compartments and in the summer we will open the new rooms without the fab lab. Perhaps um, another aspect um, of this disciplinary differences on campus. Um, I, I, I think the natural sciences don't really need us, at least here on campus, uh, when it comes to studying spaces. Uh, however, uh, they are approaching us when it comes to research data. So that is a new field, a uh, new yeah, thing we, we uh, took on uh, only a few years ago. Um, so, and, and Annette Strauch, uh, David is here, and she has become known as the person on campus when it comes to research data. So, and interesting enough, uh, they, 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 or, or uh, faculty shows up from dif different disciplines. Um, it, the, the discipline is not important, but the research project they are planning and the funds they want to get from uh, funding agencies. So that brings them to the library. Now, th th that is a different, different sphere, of course, or, or, or a different aspect. But we, we, we thought about that and said, hey, um, if, we, uh, if, if we become interesting to them with regard to research, how about the young researchers, like the docs and postdocs, um, they need space for cooperation, collaboration, et cetera. And, and lab spaces are limited, of course. So we suggested uh, to, to build a, a, a research commons, uh, which is actually would be a, a facility um, with a good technical infrastructure, with a cafe, uh, with, with room to meet, discuss, uh, have people come in for lectures, et cetera. And that might be a way to, uh, at least here in, in, in Hildesheim, um, to become more uh, interesting for even the natural sciences um, and to strengthen our cooperations. In addition to, uh, to, to uh, what we are doing, doing uh, or supporting um, uh, with regard to teaching, uh, we administer the central learning management system on campus, which brings us into contact with almost everybody <laughs> teaching on campus here. Uh, that uh, brings us a lot of work <laughs> in our house, <laughs> uh, a lot of tough questions, uh, but also a lot of opportunities. And uh, that then leads us in combination with, uh, with research data, because we see people as teachers and as researchers to the question of, of data, dealing with data and data serenity. There we are in, in strategic discussions at the university, how to deal with data, how to keep our data serenity and which IT systems we should implement uh, to keep our serenity and which uh, IT systems we should also use in the library. And uh, Constanze already meant Folio, the open source library system. Uh, at least one, uh, one part of it we will be introducing uh, in this summer. Uh, and that also leads me, at least leads us to, uh, to our next event, which will be on open source library systems, uh, but that wasn't intended here. Uh, okay, and we see a slide. Uh, so a question to, to add and Constanze, um, do you have, have similar um, cooperation topics with regard to research data, with regard to supporting teaching, learning management systems? Would you like to go Constanze? Constanze. 
as I already mentioned, the Digital Humanities Lab, mm -hmm. our research commons uh, for the humanities, uh, now in the main library, and I hope it will grow and uh, will then be in, in our new library. Um, yes, it, it's for me a really very interesting question, what are research commons in the library? The library should be not only learning commons, but uh, research commons. And if you had time, I would like not to speak myself on this topic, but to speak with you all uh, in the workshop today, but it's already late. I think maybe this is evolved, uh, a theme for next workshop already. Yeah, okay. Yeah. <laughs> so we might be thinking of, of autumn this year for a fourth online event. Research comments, something like that. Why not? <laughs> yes, I, Matt is nodding. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, thank you for mentioning this. Uh, this would also really interest me from Hildesheim and the research data management. I don't want to say uh, it's so long, but this is like with the research data management organizer. This is why um, the researchers come to the library and also like part of um, our commission for the VDB for research related services. This is what we try to develop further. So I'm looking forward to a fourth event and yeah, we'll be there and see what we can talk about. Thank you all. And I think if this sort of looking at the time, we probably need to start wrapping up. I just wanted to say very briefly, um, Ed, if you have, because you haven't really answered the final question, any, any quick comment that you still wanted to make? Uh, ju just to say thank you that this has been a great discussion it, it's really great to bring these perspectives together and, and we could go on uh, a, a long time and explore uh, a lot of new areas couldn't we but uh, no just my thanks uh, to everyone today uh, for, for kind of questions discussions uh, obviously to Constanza uh, to yourselves I will Torsten Matt for, for hosting just thank you very much indeed this has been a really positive exchange well, thank you very much also from, from my perspective. And just to say, we'll, we'll have a chance to pick up in particular the, the last topic that's come up next week, Friday, and then hopefully in a follow-on event uh, after the summer. <laughs>